This videotape is edited from an advanced NLP training in Boulder, Colorado, April 1989. Many of the participants had also attended previous advanced training with Richard. Richard considers this seminar to be his best ever presentation of how he works with clients. Although he presents some new submodality methods, his major emphasis is on how he puts things together and the methods that he uses to create lasting change. Since this is a carefully sequenced seminar, we recommend viewing the videotapes in order. Last time, I made the comment when somebody said, how do you change metaprograms, and I said, you don't. That didn't mean that you can't. That meant that you shouldn't until you really know what you're doing. That I find that a lot of times, as soon as people find out about a pattern, they immediately want to alter it. And uh, that isn't always a good thing. Because when you, go, when you start to change metaprograms, you have to have a, a rather sophisticated understanding of what's useful about them and what's not useful. Because a, a lot of people have a tendency, especially given their metaprogram, to assume that the way that when they find out how anything works, and anything has an upside and a downside, that immediately that the thing to do is to change it to another one. And the thing with metaprograms is that they all have an upside and a downside. And that given that you're at least used to your own, you're more apt to be able to use the upside. When you get a new one, you'll be more apt to just be able to use the downside. Uh, so my comment didn't mean that metaprograms are unchangeable. Uh, my comment was that given the level of skill in the room, that it, it, wasn't, it didn't strike me as advantageous to go around changing people's metaprograms, uh, especially the particular person who asked the question. <laughs> that uh, having a moving away tendency in your strategy is not necessarily bad. And I just wanted to make sure that that person kept moving away from the idea that moving away from moving away from in your strategies was going to make you sane. Uh, it's not. It'll make you more crazy. And uh, that the, ten the thing is, is that when you alter metaprograms, <laughs> that when you start to build in things, because with metaprograms, almost everything functions on a continuum. It's not that somebody is entirely a moving away from person. There's a continuum. There are certainly certain things that that even the most moving away person I know has a tendency to move towards. Um, I'm sure, Charles, you can think of some things you move <laughs> towards, right? The thing is, is to be able to amplify those things so that you do it even stronger, and then to be able to move things across the continuum that you want to change the way in which you interact with, so that you do it much more content specific. Because when you start changing pervasive patterns in your life, if you flip them around, for example, I just did a practitioner program, and somebody in there decided that they did not like the way their timeline was. So uh, I had taught them a technique for altering your timeline, but mostly something that they could do to try out differences and, uh, and also for certain activities, being in time is a lot more valuable than, I mean, there are certain activities where you want to be right there, here, now. And uh, that dealing with them as between time activities is not all that useful. Sex is one of those. Uh, if you think about it, you know, if, if you're thinking about sex with somebody else while you're having sex with this person, most of the time that's not useful. Uh, it depends upon who it is you're having sex with, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it helps a lot. Um, but uh, under normal circumstances, uh, uh, that's not a real useful way. And one of the people in the seminar decided that what they were going to do is to change theirs and leave it that way. But, uh, but since they hadn't organized their life that way, what that meant is that they couldn't remember anything, uh, which is not terribly useful, unless your life has really been shit. Uh, and most cases, that's, you, you want to be able to sort through the information in your life in a way that allows you to be able to do things other than babble. Uh, which is what this person reduced themselves to, because as soon as they found out what their timeline was, they, they had one of those things where a lot of people, everything always, look, they always assume that things work better for other people. I mean, they didn't really stop and think about who their partner was, for example, because their partner, person whose timeline they elicited on, was just short of a basket case anyway. It wasn't even one of the people in the seminar. It was a client of mine, somebody that I basically decided needed an overhaul. And uh, they decided to adopt this guy's strategies and timeline. <laughs> and quite frankly, I don't need the work that bad. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there are certain situations, for example, with people that have 
heavy uh, codependency situations. A lot of times you'll find that uh, their past is behind them and their future is in front of them. And it never alters. In fact, they don't access the past hardly at all. One of the reasons that they keep thinking they're not going to get hooked or they keep thinking they've conquered a problem because they overdose and then they wake up and they swear they'll never do it again and then 5 o'clock the next day, you know, they're down in the bar popping pills. And one of the reasons is, is that they, they don't have, they don't have uh, an in-time connection with their past at all. And so they don't, they don't feel the, the negative parts of things. They, they don't have the ability to reaccess that this is going to make me feel bad. Um, I've had a lot of clients that, that I've worked with about this kind of stuff where they even know intellectually that when they, they take these things that they don't even end up feeling good anymore. They used to at one time, but it doesn't even do that anymore. It just makes them feel bad. But then as soon as they see the object uh, of whatever it is, whether it's alcohol or pills or, or whatever, what happens in them is that the external thing has become an anchor, which triggers off in them the excitement that they had initially. And the anchor works, but it doesn't, they, don't get, they don't get the memory of the full cycle of the event. Uh, it's one of those things I remember years and years ago when LSD was a, uh, seemed to be the drug of choice that people would take it and they forgot that it lasted for six to ten hours, <laughs> right? It was like they could kind of remember enjoying it, but, but, you know, they'd like take it and then, you know, it's like three hours later they were going, I'm never going to come down ever again. And uh, some of you who were around in those eras might remember that and you always had to point out to people, look, you're in for the duration, you signed yourself up, get used <laughs> to the idea. You know, this is, this is not, this is, you know, this isn't smoking a joint. This is the big one. You're in for 10 hours. Enjoy it or freak out. You're still in for 10 hours. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that we found is useful with those people is to begin to alter their timeline, especially in relationship to, to, to drugs, so that they have some sense of the going up and the coming down, so that when they access them, what they access is the coming down. Because... For those of you, for example, those of you who've done the phobia cure, you know how you run the memory backwards? Well, if, if you can get people instead of with, with certain events to access the end of them instead of the beginning, it has a tendency to change their experience. And in terms of uh, making that possible, one of the things that helps is in relationship to those activities to alter their timeline. But it still doesn't mean that you need to alter them with all things. You don't need to fix it so that it's there permanently. Uh, just the things in which they, they have trouble in their life. See, to me, the one thing that, that I try to stress with people is that the name of the game isn't to find the right strategy. It isn't to find the right relationship to time. It isn't to be in time or between time. The thing is, is to have choices about what activities you do how. Some strategies work better for some things than others. There, there, there isn't a good motivation strategy. You want to be able to, to build in more and more flexibility. So the things you motivate yourself easily to do, you don't have to mess with those. The ones you have difficulty, then you, you can either build a new strategy, or you, sometimes people just don't use the strategy that they have. And the thing is, is to me, is, is one of the reasons I stress information gathering so much is to take the time to find out what to do with an individual. And most of the time, I spend more time finding out than I do doing whatever it is I do. Because I discovered if I find out what's going on, then usually it's pretty easy. Uh, I know that last time we spent some time, like I, I was trying to teach some of you last time, to be able to hear just distinctions about submodalities. That, uh, you know, some of the, like for those of you who've seen the Marshall University tapes, I mean, <coughs> not every client comes out and says the first line that they have a problem they need to get more distance from. But eventually they all say it. That if, if you ask them questions, one of the nice things about the meta model, and uh, this year I tried something new in the practitioner course, and it worked quite well. I taught people the Milton model first. So I decided to teach people to ask questions before you taught them to hear. It was a mistake that uh, I've, and I've had years of experience <laughs> of paying for that mistake, believe me. <laughs> that by literally grilling people through being able, we started with presuppositions, teaching people to be able to hear presuppositions in language before they started to ask questions, that one of the things that happens is that people started to use the meta model the way I use it, which is pretty much in reverse of the way in which it's presented in the book. See, the distinctions that were presented in the book uh, in Magic One, one of the things that we stressed to people was that it was a model of what therapists do. 
It was not a model of what we do. And since that's where the meta model got written up, I found that a lot of people had a tendency to ask for a lot of information that they don't want. And one of the things that I wanted to start out this morning was stressing that, like, see, if a client comes in and says, I'm depressed, what do you ask him? What's the first thing that pops in your mind? Did, some, did, did you guys hear that of what in your head? Well, the thing is, is, do you care what? OK, if you don't care what, why ask them? And, and because I found out, like, I, I, when I started this year, the practitioner course, uh, of course, a lot of the people that were in there already had had training. I mean, we had some people that, that were, had had so much training that, that, I mean, to them, they had a resounding of what in their head. And when I asked them, I said, do you care of what? And they went, no. And I said, then it's not an important question. And, they, and one of them like, raised their hand and said, you have to ask that. And I said, no, you don't. And they said, yes, you do. They said, and I said, why? And they said, because I hear the question so loud in my head. If I don't ask it, then it keeps saying it over and over again. And I said, well, that sounds like something you need to be cured of. Um, that doesn't sound like good training. That sounds like a mental disorder. Um, that, I mean, to me, that it is, it's not really important. The question is, what do you want to know about information? See, one of the things about when we developed the meta model, the purpose of the meta model was to build a model which was recursive in nature. That meant no matter what came out, there would always be a next step function. And that's because at the time we did it, most, one of the things we discovered is, is that most of the people that were in clinical practice got stuck. And that's because they had no next step function. You know, people would come in and they'd go, oh, you're depressed, and they'd go, what are you depressed about? And they'd go, you know, my husband beats me, and they'd go, God, that's a shame, <laughs> you know? <laughs> why don't you leave him, you know? And they'd go, I can't, because I love him. And they'd go, well, why don't you stop loving him? And they'd go, well, I can't, I do. And they'd go, shit, you know, I know just how you feel. My husband beats me, too. <laughs> and uh, we didn't find this to be a profoundly useful way of doing things. The other thing we found was, is without the ability to break up what clients are saying to you into pieces, because basically you've got to take information and break it down into component units when, before you can deal with it no matter what you're doing, whether it's doing therapy or whether you're programming a computer. I mean, when I was involved in programming, one of the things is, is they, they brought in this guy who is a, a top-notch accountant. And in these days, I mean, you had like thousands of cards and computers. It wasn't this laptop stuff you guys have now. I mean, they've gotten this thing down. Or Macs, you just put your hand on a ball and roll it around. I mean, they're making this stuff so easy now. They're actually making computers usually friend user friendly. I mean, these days, they couldn't have been more user vicious. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it used to be that you had to, like, when you, wanted to when you wanted to bulletproof a program, you had to take a sheet of paper and roll it down a hallway, right? You know, and it'd be, you know two or three hundred feet long, and you get guys every ten feet, right? And then you'd yell out what was on your line, and the guy down there would yell out what would be next, you know? And that's how you had to hunt for an error, you know, because it could take one typo, and the whole thing wouldn't work, and you had to find out somebody got an A or a B in the wrong place, you know, it'd mess up the whole thing, and you had to look for this thing with, you know, with a group of people, you know? When they talked about a team programming something, they weren't kidding, you know? And if you didn't have a long hallway in your office, you were, you know, you had to wait for a sunny day and go in the parking lot. <laughs> and in those days, when they brought an accountant in, and this accountant was going to talk about what needed to be in an accounting program, and I mean, now there are lots of nice little neat accounting programs, but in those days, for him to under understand that, you know, in order to just post one check was a complex series of zeros and ones, that that activity had to be broken down into a, a whole bunch of little tiny steps before you could take it and translate it to the machine. Now, when a client comes in and says something as simple as I'm depressed, right, that what, they, what they're doing is, you know, because I, I always love to ask them, they come in and you go, what's the problem? Right? And they throw out this one line or two, I'm depressed. And, you know, there's a lot of questions you can ask. I mean, one of my favorites is, so what? <laughs> it's a lot more useful than of what, if you stop and think about it. But basically what they've done is take a whole set of huge activities that they engage in, external behaviors, internal information, and they've compressed them down into a representation that's, that's, that's in essence just one little chunk of words. And words are, and people forget this most of the time, words are only a way of talking about things. 
that, you know, that you can use a very simple description. I mean, when you haven't seen somebody in a long time, I mean, you can go, how have you been? And, you know, they could be talking about a year or three years of their life, and they can look back at you and go, pretty good, right? Now, that's taking a lot of stuff and just packaging it down with one label. Now, since you don't have to change their past, that's fine. I mean, that's all you need to do. It's adequate for the purpose of just going, hi, how are you? Okay. But when you get down to the thing where you really want to be able to alter something, you have to begin to unpack. And that means that a lot of what you unpack, you don't need. The trick is, is to be able to get out the stuff you need and you can do something with and leave the rest alone that one of the, the reasons we started doing what was called secret therapy, we used to have people literally use uh, alphanumeric variables. I mean, some of you may have remembered we had them, you pick the part of you A that does this and a part B, and literally work without content. And that, you know, the kinds of things like doing secret therapy, learning to, you know, make changes and anchoring people without knowing what it was about, was for us a step to begin to teach people that it isn't the content that changes people. In fact, it's the content that gets in the way most of the time. Now, when we went, went through and trained people that way for a while, then one of the things that happened is as we began to reintroduce content back in, some people have gotten locked into the content. That they begin to think that all depression works the same way. They be, have begun to fall back into psychiatric categories. That they're, they're, the fact is, is that even if you can change things for, that have a certain characteristic the same way, it doesn't mean that they all work the same way. That there's lots of different ways to acquire phobias. And the phobias themselves may operate in different ways. That uh, in the trainer's uh, training uh, <coughs> last year, one of the, the things I gave them as a test was, was I told them to figure out what do you do with somebody who has a phobia of making images of themselves. I'm always so kind to the people in my trainings. I said, go home, think about that. Now, now, the thing is, is that, that the paradox that I gave them was only a paradox in that the technique that they knew about fixing phobias now, was one that included making pictures of yourself. They immediately made it into a cataclysmic problem because what was the presupposition? The presupposition is that's the only way to do it. And that's where the, the paradox lies is, is there's a hundred ways to do it. And if, uh, if you just set up one set of parameters that says, well, gee whiz, we're going to do it without pictures this time, then all you have to do is to approach it in a different way. The fact that you have a solution doesn't make it the only solution, and it doesn't always make it the best solution. And one of the things that's happened in the training in NLP that I, I've discovered over the years is people have mistaken the techniques with the technology. The technology is an information gathering technology. And a lot of what's fallen out of it is a trail of techniques over the years, some of which are useful and some of which we don't even use anymore. Um, you know, things like six step reframing, as far as I'm concerned, is a completely antiquated technique. I don't have a use for it anymore. There isn't anything that comes along that I don't have a better and quicker way of doing. So, I mean, to me, it reduces it to archaeology. But the one thing that's useful is, is to know, as far as I'm concerned, that you can do things two ways. That if people come along now and learn the latest way of doing it, and then begin to think that's the only way. Uh, I had one of the people in my seminar this year, uh, my practitioner course, was already somebody else's trainer. And uh, that person insisted that you couldn't, you couldn't do NLP if you couldn't do six-step reframing. And, uh, and this is where you begin to canonize information. Now, since this is all pretty much my hallucination, I figured if they were talking to anybody about what you could and could not do, I figured they would at least have the sense to keep their mouth shut when talking to me. <laughs> but no! <laughs> Instead, you know, because, I mean, because, so I started to have fun with it. I started to ask questions like, how would you be handicapped as a neurolinguistic programmer if you didn't know? <laughs> I, you know, I said, was there, is there something that you wouldn't be able to do? You know, and they said, well, if, you know, if you don't know all the techniques, then you're not qualified in NLP. And I said, that must make you pretty unqualified. <laughs> and they said, what do you mean? I know all the techniques. And I named off about 20 techniques that I hadn't taught anybody yet. <laughs> and, of course, they sat there with their jaw open, and they said, well, those aren't in the books. And I said, oh, then you only have to know the techniques in the books in order to be qualified. But see... 
to be qualified to me is to understand that the techniques are an outgrowth of a technology that's about asking questions and sorting out information. That making distinctions between uh, what's an internal response, what's an external behavior, uh, that, that there are levels of things that are generalizations, there, there are automated responses. There's lots of things going on in human beings simultaneously. When I try to teach uh, people, like in the trainer's training, I teach people to do this thing with nested loops where they have to do 11 things at the same time. <coughs> and they always act like it's an overwhelming task. But yet they're doing that plus that and much more all the time. The question is to be able to automate things so it goes into your unconscious and comes out automatically. That one of the most amazing things to me is that, is that when people have trouble believing that people do things unconsciously. I mean, I, I get this all the time from people, you know, well, do you really believe there's an unconscious? And I go, no, I don't believe there's an unconscious. There's a tremendous amount of unconscious processes. And they go, well, I have no evidence of that. And I said, how do you understand language? And that's always the quickest transinduction I know. <laughs> that's where they go. <laughs> and then you lift their hand up and you go, close your eyes and don't worry about this. Just feel good. And your question will dissolve now. The thing is, is that language itself is an unconscious process. We don't know how we understand language. As you listen to me now, you are processing the information pretty much unconsciously. You're also, all of you, processing it in different kinds of ways. That some of you are, and as we began to find out, well, how do people consciously represent what's going on at the unconscious level, that's when we found out, well, some people are really fast making pictures of it. You know, some people are carrying on another internal dialogue about it. Some people sort it as a sequence of feelings. Now, as you begin to do that, you end up getting nice things. You get rep systems, you get chaining for the, it's basically what a kinesthetic person does is they take your language and they follow it with, a, with what's called a chain, a series of internal anchors. So that if you use your language and you cycle through the same chain enough times, you end up installing a nice chain. And it's a hypnotic process. Most of you have done chaining in here. True? That's where you install a series of feelings so you can fire off the first anchor and it fires off the others. You don't only do that with your fingers. You can do that with your language as well. I realize that some people, they, they decide, if you don't touch them, I'm really anchored. You know, and I go, think about this. <laughs> <laughs> to be careful, I'm going to go to Germany this year. <laughs> I'll go, you guys got it? <laughs> think about it this way. I have a, I'm going to feel sorry for that city. It's not going to be the same. I'm going at Oktoberfest. It's perfect time for me to go. Get a country drunk, bring Richard over. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> um, so anyway, in light of the kinds of things that I'm talking about, for me, the nice thing about the kind of group we're doing here is it's a chance to get away from just learning a rote technique and to begin to move into what I consider to be more information about the technology. See, like one of the things I've found is, is that, that when, see, when, when I work with a client or I work with somebody in a company, I mean, when I go in and I do management consulting or, or a lot of times I'm brought in mostly to do things like troubleshooting. They, I was just uh, recently, I went in to work with a company and they make their money uh, ca cashing insurance. They're, it's a sports medical clinic. And what they do is they take people who have some kind of a chronic injury, right? In other words, they've been to the doctor, but it's three years later and their leg's still fucked up. And what they do is they, they have like a whole health spa with all the weight equipment. They've got neurologists on staff and the whirlpools and the jazzercise classes and the swimming pools and, and, and it's stuff there that I didn't even know. They have little electric things they hook up to you and shock the shit out of you in just the right way. And they had some real, they had, looked like, you know, I kept hearing Boris Karloff music as I walked through this place. But they have a problem, which is, is that they, they don't charge people anything for their service. They get it all from the insurance. Most insurance pays like 80%, but what they do is they pay the other part. And, but what they need in order to make that function is for people to go to all their appointments. And what happens is as soon as people begin to get better, they look, instead of going three times a week, they start dropping by once a week, right? And what happens is, is that it takes away their ability to not charge them in the beginning the 20%. They need people to go all the time. So they brought me in as a consultant because they didn't know how to approach the problem. See, they were thinking maybe they shouldn't get people to be better for a while. 
I mean, they were considering these kind of alternatives. Maybe we could just make them worse for a while, and then when we have all the money, then we'll fix them. Because they have some really unique uh, abilities. I mean, their success rate is, in essence, too high for the method by which they charge. But they can't change the way in which they charge because they're doing it off of insurance. And the insurance companies aren't interested in getting better. They're interested in protecting themselves against fraud. So thereby, they're forcing people to commit fraud in order to get paid. It's the American way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Now, when I go into troubleshooting a problem like this, the thing is, is that what I keep in mind is, is the direction in which they want to go. Because, you see, they've already ruled out so many things, and they, they start with too many things as given. And the first thing to do is to examine the presuppositions. For example, you know, they, to ex the presupposition that they can't go to an insurance company and make another arrangement, you know. Uh, you know I mean, especially because given that the largest, uh, something like 70% of their business, is Blue Cross. To assume that you cannot deal with Blue Cross, that there isn't anybody there that has decision-making power, this is like a pretty big assumption. I would think that you know, there'd be somebody at Blue Cross who is there because his job is to make sure they turn a profit. Right? And if instead of having to go to 27 sessions, going, if we can fix the person in five, we'll give you this amount of money. Right? But if it takes 15, we only pay you for 10. See, this is the kind of thing, because somebody at Blue Cross is a businessman. They're not all doctors, so they're not all locked into that modality. Now, it may be that they're bean pushers. It's impossible. But to start out having ruled it out, to me, is too big of an assumption. Now, whether it's a business consulting or with a client, the first thing I want to know is what is the list of presuppositions I have to deal with, because some of them might be too big of presuppositions. So the information I'm after is which presuppositions have a foundation and which ones don't. Because to me, this is a huge piece of information. Then the next thing is, is, is that as you begin to gather information, if you don't fill in details, because if you don't start asking the who questions, the who specifically, the what specifically, and specifying every single verb, because to me, I don't want to specify information until I'm headed towards a solution. See, that kind of information, the information that's raw data, that's exactly what check is going to be posted, as opposed to the process of posting a check, as, e as to even knowing how you're going to post. When I was designing an accounting program, I mean, 25 years ago, the f you know, all I wanted to know is what the activities were. And, and if I'd asked him, well, how specifically do you post a check, right, he would have told me one way. But there may be lots of ways of doing it. The only thing I needed to know was that you, know, you had to get the information from the check into the somewhere in there. Now, see, for example, when I did this activity, the accountant told me the information for each check had to be posted together. Right? In other words, well, that's because that's the only way he'd seen it, was on a check, together. He wanted to take the check, and instead of sticking it in a drawer, he wanted to stick it in a computer. So he assumed everything had to be there. Now, the first guy that had worked with this guy before me, had written a program that was so lengthy that uh, you would have needed so much computer memory because every time you entered the check, you also entered all the information on the check. So for example, for the, somebody wrote 40 checks, you had to put this guy's name in 40 times. And the program was entirely for him and his machine alone. And, but every check had to have this information on it. And since the accountant told this guy this, he programmed it. Not only that, each time he did it, he had to enter his own name. Right? It's his computer. It should know who he is. Right? I mean, now, if it was posting checks for 15 people, it would still need to know who he is, but it would only need to know who he is once. Now, if you were going to enter 15 checks and you had to enter your own name 15 times, that's not very efficient, is it? Most of you, have, if any of you have an accounting program, it's probably not that hard on you now. That's 25 years of development. Think about it. Has it developed that much? Now, the thing is, is that the same thing is true when I'm trying to find out what I'm going to do with somebody. The thing is, is I'm trying to slice out redundancy of information. The quickest way to do that is to stick with higher level patterns. I want to know at the largest level what kinds of processes are at work. Now, the, the way in which I gather information isn't by telling people they're supposed to tell me this. Because if they knew it, then it'd be that old thing where it's really obvious. Uh, I don't know if some of you have noticed, there's a lot of books coming out with people who have discovered NLP recently. We were just talking about this this morning. 
And it's amazing to me how somebody can discover rep systems and anchoring and all of this stuff. And it only took them a couple of months. You know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I was slow. It took me 20 years to figure this stuff out. But uh, it's, I don't know. You know, they go to a seminar and they go home and they sleep and they wake up the next morning and it's in their mind just like that. Now, one of the things I know is, is that as, as much as somebody can go home and write a book about that, it doesn't tell them how to use it. Because one of the things that I always know is that ultimately, with people like that, they're going to end up negotiating with me. Now, uh, I, I wouldn't want to be real impressed with a psychological technology and try to steal it from the person who developed it, especially if that person didn't have a real good attitude to start with. I mean, I get this a lot of times in seminars with people that try to come up and use my techniques on me. And they don't realize that this will piss me off, right? And that, that what will happen is, is that I will do something to them. It won't be what they asked for, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, I had one guy come home from the practitioner course, and he called me on the phone and told me he was having a certain sexual problem. And did I think there was any relationship between the example I kept giving him over and over <laughs> and over again? And I said, nah, it's probably a coincidence. <laughs> and he bought it. That's what I love. <laughs> he bought it. <laughs> I hung up the phone and I went, Jesus Christ. You know. And he went, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably just a phase. And I said, yeah, some of them are long, some of them are short. <laughs> you figure you'd get a giggle out of that, you know? But no. Now. The thing that I'd like to focus on here, no matter what it is, because I know that, that a lot of you have different questions about different things, and I want to go through them. But I want you to keep in mind, as, and, and I did this little bracket ahead of time, is that if, if, if somebody asks a question or wants to know about something, or a lot of times I get my favorite question is, can you tell me more about this? Of course, the answer is yes or no. Um, but see. I hear that there's a conversational postulate that goes with that, which means I don't know what to ask about. When somebody says, can you tell me more about in time, through time, and between time, and they don't have a question, that tells me what my job is as opposed to the fact that their, their lack of understanding of the technology. Because see, the technology provides you a question. The fact that the thought is on your mind has to do with the fact that there's something about that that triggers off in you that there's somewhere to go. Now the question about how to get started going and in which direction it's going to be is where the technology lies. Because the technology of NLP is just in its infancy as far as I'm concerned. I know a lot of people think it's real developed, but I don't. Not at all. We haven't even gotten rocking and rolling yet. We're just getting warmed up. I mean, you know, any field that's only 20 years old, you know, and people are going, well, you know, we're finished. It's done. I mean, sounds like the field of optics. Field of Optics, actually, when I was in college, actually said in the beginning of the textbooks that it was the only closed field, that they knew everything there was to know and they had all the equations. And then, you know, some asshole came along and invented lasers and then fob fiber optics and now they have these inverse lenses and stuff. And uh, now they have to go back and reprint all these textbooks and charge again for them. Um, but, I mean, lots of fields go through the phase where they think that they know everything. In our field, Given that it's built on one recursive equation, it should start out with everybody knowing you can't be done when dealing with recursion. Recursion means there's always a next step. Anything can be streamlined better, and there's always new things to do. And there's, I mean, you can make it more complex, you can make it simpler, you can make it complex and then streamline it in new directions. But there's all kinds of things to do. But I want you to focus your attention and to make a, in your, for those of you taking notes, Put this in bold letters, OK? Remember to pay attention to the process that goes on here as much as the information. It's not just if somebody asks me a question, the answer that I give them. It's going to be how I find out what to answer them. Because it's not so much that I have the answer. To begin with, I have to figure out what the question is. And that really is much more difficult. With, with clients, it's figuring out what you're going to do that's the hard part. Not figuring out what they ask for, because if they were asking for what they needed, they'd probably already have it. When people come in, and uh, I, had a, I had a great one. I had a guy I saw up in Montreal. And the guy had something, uh, apparently a big thing back in New York, called a social phobia.
was. He'd been through a, it's, it's not like an agoraphobic can't leave their house. A social phobic can leave their house. They just can't talk to anybody while they're out there. And uh, uh, this guy actually said he was all right talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, but if there was anybody else sitting there, he just freaked. And I mean, you know, and it was interesting because I didn't know what his problem was, and I had him uh, meet me while I was doing, after I did a workshop. And so I was sitting in the bar talking to about 10 people at a table, and he walked in, and he walked up, and he went, and just stood there locked like this about 15 feet away. And I didn't, I didn't know. I kind of thought it might be him because he looked like he was in mortal panic, uh, and which a lot of my clients are, uh, whether they have phobias or not. And I, I looked up, and I thought it might be him, but I figured if it was him, he'd come up and talk to me. But I didn't know what the problem was, that he had a problem talking to people. So I, I sat there, and he just kept sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And finally, he started putting one foot in front of the other. And I mean, he looked like he was, had glue on his feet. It was like this thing, like getting closer and closer. He got about 15 feet away. And, and I yelled. I said, are you so-and-so? And he went like this. And I said, 11 o'clock tomorrow. And he went, Phew, and he was gone. Now, uh, this kind of gave me an idea that maybe there was something going on here, <laughs> sensory experience. So when he came in the next day, I said, I said, I have an intuition. And the guy went, what? You know. Now, and I said, I said, your problem has something to do with relating to people. And he was amazed. You know, I always love it. I always blow your clients out. It builds in blind faith, which is always helpful. So he looked at me and he says, yeah. And he explains to me that he's been to this institute at Rockefeller for, because they, what they do is, of course, whenever you want to learn about something, uh, the field of psychology it always uses the premise, start with the people who know the least about it. Uh, it's the basics. So they had collected together all these social phobics, and they put them through this 18-week program together. <laughs> this guy told me this. I'm roaring with laughter. And he kept going, I don't see what's so funny. You know? These people were sincerely trying to help. And I said, I, said, I don't know. I just know I'm going to be telling people about this. This is too good. You take a group of social phobics, and you put them in a group of people, group together with six or eight of them, and then you have one psychologist there who tries to help them to be able to relate to each other better. Because after all, they figure they have something they share in common. But of course, since it's the end of, and he told me at the end of six or, six or eight weeks, everybody was pretty much the same, except for him. And I said, what do you mean, except for you? And he said, and I want you to remember the day before, OK? This guy tells me. He managed to cure himself 75% from reading my book. And I thought, if this guy got cured 75%, he must have been a little tense before that. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, if that was a 75% cure. But then he proceeded to tell me that after having read my book, you know, and he did the thing in the book, and he, as far as, and he was sincere, man. I know he was not lying to me, but I mean, he was convinced he had cured himself 75%, which meant he must have been real fucked up. That, uh, and I mean, he'd had this thing ever since he could remember. This isn't something that like dropped out of the sky. This was a lifestyle, and apparently it's fairly common in New York. Uh, <laughs> certain congruity there that fit for me, you know, because I asked him, I said, is this all over the country? And he said, well, I don't know. I've, always been in New York. But of course, how would he know? He doesn't talk to people anyway. <laughs> so what happened is, is then he proceeded to tell me that he went to three or four different neuro-linguistic programmers who were unable to make it any better. He said, maybe they made it a little better. And so I asked him, I said, well, did they do this thing where they had to make a picture of yourself, making a picture just to find out? And sure enough, they had taken him through the phobia cure. But they assumed that, they assumed that it run him through the bill. They'll come out the other side fine. Now, the thing is, is that, the, that to begin with, this guy didn't have the reference structures because the phobia cure is based on your having an example of having been in the situation. And this guy, the only time he'd ever been with a group of people had been, uh, for example, he had to go to retirement dinners where he worked. It's the only time he had to interact with people. He went out and hid at his car at lunchtime. Now, I mean, I'm serious. This guy, this guy, this is an adult man, you know, older than I am, looking me straight in the eye, telling me for 16 years at lunch, so he doesn't have to go in the cafeteria, takes his, goes out at lunch, and, and so people don't see him from work, because they might be going in and out, gets on the floor of the back seat of his car and eats out of a brown paper bag. Now, that constitutes a fear in my book. 
I don't know about you guys, but to, I mean, you have to understand that to him, this was a lifestyle. So that, as, as to me, I don't think I'm dealing with a phobia. And I didn't hear it that way. But the people that, when he went in, since he said, I have a phobia of people, he didn't have a phobia of people. He didn't even know if he was afraid of people because he hadn't been in the situation to find out. He was so afraid thinking about it and even approaching it that what he'd done is built a lifestyle out of fear. Build, and he was so good at building the fear, he could have built a fear of anything. Now, uh, what do you think this guy did for a living? This will crack you up. What do you think this guy did for a living? Huh? <laughs> This guy was a private investigator. So what does he do all the time? He goes around and talks to people. That's all he does. Now, I don't know, but you, does that sound a little incongruent? I mean, because I mean, you know, because I asked that guy, because I, I thought if he had trouble talking to people, you know, I wondered what he did. I thought, you know, and uh, I don't know any computer nerds that have a good enough memory to have this kind of disorder. So <laughs> I, I rolled that one right out. So I asked him what did he do, and the guy said he was a uh, PI. Now, I know that asking people what they do for a living isn't part of the meta model, but you see, it's, it, it doesn't say anywhere that these are the only questions that you ask. And I realize that some people, see, because I noticed this a lot. See, it's been, it's been about five years since I did a practitioner course all by myself. And a lot of the people that were in my course were already practitioners. And they had spent so much time learning the meta model, they forgot there are other questions. And that the purpose of, of using the meta model is to, so that you will always have a next step function. So there'll always be something to do, not so that it's the only thing you do. And that the purpose of asking questions of the client is to find out enough information about what's going on to figure out how to make it better and what to make better. See, if with this guy, if his whole life revolves around fear, and avoiding talking to people. See, he was a private investigator because he could talk to people one at a time. He just couldn't talk to them two at a time. Or he couldn't talk to them if there were other people there watching. Plus, he wasn't the kind of PI that has to testify in court. He had a, state, he had a, a job with the state investigating disability fraud, um, which apparently he had to pick his job quite carefully because he had to make sure that he would never have to be in, in on, or around a group of people. Now, the thing is, is that as you begin to listen to somebody like him and to ask them questions, the process by which they build the fear themselves in their mind, because it's, it's the process of building fear, and because he doesn't build a fearful situation, he builds a potential fearful situation and then figures out how to respond to it. So his whole life revolves around what one might call a very huge moving away from strategy. But first, he has to figure out what he might have to move away from, and then actually moves away from it before it's there. Now, so I had to give him something, of course, to motivate him, big to move away from, like death. That's always a good one. Uh, or I could do what I do with a lot of my clients is, is I use timelines in reverse. I put them into the future 20 years and have them doing exactly what they're doing now and have them sit so that they look at their whole life as being what I think it will actually be. That scary thought, huh? <laughs> a few of you in there stopped breathing all of a sudden. <laughs> That's what I do with them, the other ones. <laughs> that I've discovered that one of the things that happens is, is that it puts a different perspective that uh, I, I kind of got the idea one time because uh, Todd Epstein, who is one of the people that I trained some time back, uh, came to me one, once, and he was just somebody I knew that played rock and roll in a bar. And uh, this was probably about 10 years ago. And he said he wanted to learn to do the kind of stuff that I did. And at the time, it seemed real incongruent for Todd because Todd was probably one of the best musicians in town. and He was always kind of an egomaniac about being a guitar player. For him to come to me and want to learn to do what I did, was totally off the wall. And I said, well, why do you want to do this? And he said, because I want to learn to help people. And I said, you lying scum. You know, I said, I'd, there might be people I'd believe that from, but I don't believe that from you for a minute, Epstein. And he kind of smiled. And he said, well, he said, let me tell you the truth. He said, I was playing in the crow's nest the other night. 
And I was sitting there playing, and, and I stopped, and I thought about playing in the crow's nest 10 or 15 years from now. I thought about being 45 years old, sitting here in the same bar, uh, you know, playing the same songs, and it scared the hell out of me. And I said, now this I believe. So I started using that with clients as a way to begin to build in a perspective, you know, of, uh, you know, starting because when people are moving away from things, one of the things that they're not moving away from is what they're going to miss out on. Because before you can take the fear out of this guy's life, you have to have already built up what's going to fill that void. And to me, that has to do with building in a desire because it's, he doesn't, see, for example, you can imagine this guy don't date a lot. You know, he's, he doesn't go cruising bars looking for chicks. Um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, if somebody came up and said they wanted to introduce him to a girl, that's three people right there. Um, and uh, in fact, the only reason he's good at being an investigator is because his interactions with others are structured. He has a form, and he gets to ask the questions on the form, and they get to give the answers. Now, as, as I listen to all of this information, I begin to structure in my mind what I consider to be a transition model to life. And the, the same thing is true when I do business consulting or other things, that for me, I'm beginning to examine what kinds of generalizations have to be broken, which ones have to be built, that it's not a simple thing of which technique do I have to apply. To me, what I want to do is to build a whole package. And I think too often that when people go through training programs, they're looking for which technique to use with which problem because of the way that we teach them. That when we teach them, we teach, OK, phobia, phobia fix. But you see, that's, that's, that's a way of learning. Just like when you learn the meta model, you learn it one distinction at a time. It doesn't mean you only ask one distinction. You learn deletion, why learn the others? You know, there's a deletion in every sentence. What do you need the rest of the meta model for? I mean, it makes sense. There's a presupposition to every sentence. So just learn to challenge presuppositions. I mean, the rest of it could just be time consuming. Who knows? It might make you skilled. You get skilled, your clients get better, and then you have to get a new job anyway. You could be learning your whole life. I mean, you know, oh, God, that would be boring, wouldn't it? You know, instead of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. But you see, when, when a guy like this who has been doing the same things over and over again, arranging his whole life that way, that even if you, if, you, if you knock out the fear, it's only going to work this way. And you can always tell that this phenomenon is happening when you begin to get people that, that start to tell you that there's problem X, right? And you apply a technique, and they tell you you now have X minus Y. They tell you it's better, but have you ever heard that, right? It's, it's not as bad as it was. Right? Well, what you're getting is, and, and I think that probably a lot of you hear this a lot more than you'd like to admit, that what you're getting is, is, is an indication that all you can do is reduce a situation. Because there's a complex set of activities that interact. It's, in his case, he has, he has the fear of people. Now, but the fear of people itself is not all that's going on. It's not that this is the problem. It's not even that this is the symptom. This is, this is an indication, but his entire life revolves around this. It's the way in which he plans. But these things are all a byproduct of a meta program. And the way in which he plans, the things he can do, the things he cannot do. See, he don't need an excuse to, go out, to not go out and, and meet people. He doesn't need an excuse. He, and I mean, he doesn't need an excuse. It never occurs to him to go job hunting, to look for a better job. It never occurs to him to even think about whether he's bored or likes or dislikes the job that he has. Now, if you knock this fear out, he has to start thinking about those things all at once without any way to be able to do it. So what will happen is, is the symptom will come right back in. Because, you see, it's, it's not a symptom that, that you need to get rid of. Initially, what you need to do is to be able to make the, the change in it something which alters the rest of this. Now, it may, may mean that you want to build in a whole new complex. I mean, with some people, that's the way I, I go about it. I build them a whole new complex that's as solid as the one they have. 
that has the parameters of metaprograms. It's got to have metaprograms in it. It's got to have chains in it. It's got to have a whole set of interactions that's as stable as what this guy has. Now, the stability is not built on the fear because you can't get rid of the fear because the rest of it's so stable. You can reduce it. I mean, when he said that, I, that reading the, the phobia cure in the book and doing it had reduced his fear 75%, he wasn't kidding. But he also was still aimed. Now, you have to think about, this guy went to four different neurolinguistic programmers. He went to a group of social phobics at Rockefeller University. It wasn't even that he couldn't confront his fear. He sat in a group for eight weeks, and then he told me that after the group was over, he went and spoke to each of the other people in it individually <laughs> and found out that they all agreed that they hadn't gotten better at all. Now, this means that this guy's fear isn't even real. I mean, in other words, it feels real, but it isn't related to the activity it's supposed to be about. If you cured him of his inability to go up and talk to people, you'd be curing him of something he doesn't need to be cured of. He's doing it anyway. He just doesn't notice when he does it. It's, not, it's only when he notices that he's interacting with a group of people that it makes a difference. Say, I mean, he can call on the phone. He can go talk to people. He can talk to all the social phobics. In fact, he, he told me that after the group met, he didn't just go up to them individually. I said, you went around to each of them. You went over to their house. He said, no, afterwards, a group of us were talking. <laughs> now, I, I was so tempted to slap him in the face with it, but it wouldn't have done any good because immediately he would have gone into the fudge factor or the finagle phenomenon, which is the reason why this doesn't count. Well, the reason why it doesn't count is that he still feels the fear when he thinks about it, which means he can manufacture it. Now, being able to figure out the way in which you're going to deal with something like this and how you're going to alter it, because you're thinking about it as a system. The kinds of questions that I'm going to ask you as, I, as we go through, because I'm going to find out what kinds of things you want to know more about, and as, as people ask questions, I'm going to begin to find out what's going on. Because I have to find out, what do you really want to know? This guy came and hired me. If 75% of it is gone, and it, you know, then he would have come, you know, if it was enough, he would have been able to come up and talk to me in the bar. You know, and I mean, if he said, you know, and he even said, you know, when I asked him about, you know, I said, well, probably this is why you couldn't come up and talk to me in the bar yesterday. And he said, well, yeah, he said, I was petrified. He said, if you were only sitting with one or two people, I would have at least been able to walk up. And I said, you mean there's like, you know, this linear relationship between how many people? You have to count them and decide how afraid you're going to be? And he answered, yes, without jumping a beat. Made sense to him. Now, the thing I have to be able to do is to make it so that doesn't make sense. Because, you know, if you're going to change this guy to somebody who's going to be able to make something out of his life, the thing is, is that he has to be more scared of something else. And it has to propel him as strongly. He is propelled by his fear to engage in all of these activities. The activities of searching for a cure, the activities of going to the groups at Rockefeller, the activity of planning where he's going to have lunch every day. He, and the, one of the reasons they couldn't cure it is that every time he knows that he absolutely has to be in a situation and he can't get out of it, that what he does is he drinks himself into a, basically a state of obliterated. So when he had to go to the two retirement dinners, basically what he did is got himself so schnocked that he, could, he was barely aware of his surroundings. Um, you know, he's lucky he was a little younger. He could have discovered stronger drugs. But uh, since he couldn't talk to people, he didn't find out about them. Um, there is a fringe benefit to everything, I suppose. You know, somebody should have said, here, take this heroin. You won't notice a thing. Um, first one's free. Other than that, it's one-on-one. -on -one. All you have to talk to is me and your needle. Um, the thing is, is that to be able to build in a thing which propels him into life as strongly as the fear propels him away from it is the kind of thing that I'm going to be looking for with a client like him. That, I mean, even though I, I don't spend an extended amount of time with him, two-thirds of the time I spend gathering information and figuring out what I'm going to do. So that, because to me, it isn't just trying things to find out what works. That's a good place to start when you're doing NLP at the practitioner level. But by the time you're a master practitioner, you should know what the hell you're doing. You should be able to think about it and decide what you're doing ahead of time and decide how the different things balance off between one another. That there are multiple levels of things going on in people, and they do interact with one another. And I mean, I, most of the time when I talk to people in this field about metaprograms, 
They can't even talk to, to me about how the distinctions and metaprograms interact with each other. They pick their favorite distinction and talk about it by itself. And see, to me, that's not thinking about it as a technology. That's thinking about it as symptomatic, as if metaprograms were like a, a way of diagnosing people. People who have uh, extensive backgrounds in psychology have a tendency to use everything for diagnosis, because that's what they learn to do. When we first came up with the concept of representational systems and talked about how some people, you know, spend a lot of time visualizing and some a lot of time paying attention to their feelings and some talking to themselves, immediately they began to, uh, the people got into diagnosing people as visuals. Instead of, instead of people visualizing a lot, engaging in activity, it immediately got normalized in a diagnostic category. If you can break away in the course of this weekend from thinking about NLP as a new way to diagnose people and start to really get into the process, because it's what makes NLP fun and fascinating. It's when you really begin to see how these things interact. Because to me, the complex system by which this guy worked was so complex and so solid that four skilled neurolinguistic programmers couldn't make a dent in it. But this guy could read a book and make a dent in it by himself. Now, does that make him more skilled than them? Probably, <laughs> is my answer. Because the thing is, is that when they, when they looked, when they looked at the, the technology of NLP, they looked at it as if you diagnose a problem. This is a phobia, and you take a technique and fix it. And they didn't look at the, because you see, the, the whole underlying premise of NLP is that people are not broken. They work perfectly. The trick is, is to find out how. And then, if you're going to do something to, because some people's lives work perfectly, but it's perfect shit, you know. And I mean, to me, whether this guy lives this way or not is of no consequence. It really isn't. And that's one of the reasons I can change it is because if he, if he lives that way, you know, it's not going to spoil my life. But if he's tired of it and really wants to change it, then I can find out enough about it to make it so that it is as compulsively different. And, uh, you know, there are some people that appear more compulsive than others. I had a, a client recently that was uh, what one might refer to as a little compulsive as about his hypochondria. I mean, his thing is, is that whenever he noticed even a slight change in a mole, he had to go consult a doctor because it might be cancer. And if the doctor told him it was fine, then he had to see a hundred others just to make sure. And I'm not exaggerating numbers-wise either here. I mean, and, you know, I asked him, you know, that if one of them told him it was cancer, you know, uh, then, you know, in terms of how it would be treated, would you have to see a uh, hundred doctors to find out? And he looked at me and said, of course. And I said, would you go to the same hundred? And he looked at me like I was nuts. I mean, to him, of course you wouldn't go back to the 99 that diagnosed wrong. You'd have to go out and find 100 more. I mean, this is like a full-time job. It's a little compulsive. I mean, you know, I'm sure his, you know, the guy that carries his health insurance is not a happy camper. But, <laughs> but I, mean, I mean, to him, you know, everything was three-digit numbers. I mean, safety was, I mean, none of this second opinion stuff for him. Now, but I mean, this, I mean, how many of you have been to the doctor? Yeah, I want you to think about it for, for the time you went to the doctor. If you had to go a hundred times, what happens to your life? What life? <laughs> right? Now, if you had to go to the doctor three times, multiply that by a hundred. Right? Now, and then if they were, then, but that's just to find out what's wrong. Then if they were going to actually prescribe something for you, then you have to double it and multiply it by a hundred. I mean, we're talking about a, you know, a fairly busy schedule. I mean, it could take months to, you know, to, to do something just about your sinuses, you know. <laughs> By the time you got, got around to curing your hay fever, you'd be in a whole new season. Um, now, those kind of people appear compulsive. But there's a level. Well, they do. You know, I mean, but there's a level at which everybody is compulsive. Everybody is compulsive. Remember last time as we went through that metaprogram stuff? Didn't your partners appear to be compulsive at that level? I mean, you know, that even when it became, when we did the, the stuff, where, there's a point, remember, where I, I told you it turns into high comedy? You guys remember that? That it's, it's, because it's so much a part of you, you can't not do it, right? And I mean, even when you're talking about it, you're doing it. This is one of the reasons I told people not to try to change the metaprograms, is because the very decision by which, 
that you're going to make to change it is going to be based on it. And if it's not a good program, that's not a good way to base the decision. Right? I mean, it's like, to me, it's the one thing which people are not qualified to decide themselves, which is how they're going to change themselves at that level. And that's the kind of level at which you begin to find really compulsive, uh, you know, a psychologist might call it a life script, but to me it's more pervasive than that. It's an intricate, well-balanced system. It's a well-oiled machine that works perfectly. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the reason to be alive. It's what this person's life job is. This is what they do. This is not something that operates from moment to moment. See, to me, a phobia is, you're fine. You're cruising through life. You walk by an elevator, you freak out. You don't spend your life figuring out how to avoid elevators, right? You just move to a town that's flat, and it's over with. But I mean, I mean it's, you know, it's one thing when you have somebody that, that you know, says, well, I can't meet you on the fourth floor. I have, you know, on the 15th floor, I have an elevator phobia. How about the fourth floor? You know, I can walk up the stairs. I mean, that's real different than somebody whose entire day-to-day -day life revolves around this. See, some people's life revolves around from morning till night impressing other people. Now, the problem is, is that most of the time they don't know if they've impressed someone or not because they gauge it off of a series of nonverbal cues that they've already decided, probably at age five or something, that certain looks are disapproval, certain looks are approval, and they know which ones are which, so it doesn't matter how you really feel on the inside because they're going to decide anyway. Now, this isn't even a conscious decision, but all of their behavior are behaviors to try to get you to generate those cues. Now, if somebody's entire life is involved in doing this, then they'll, always, they'll, they'll have lots of complaints about why they're unhappy. But it's not even at this point that there's a conscious process going on. It is, it is an ever-consuming process that they're engaged in. Now, to me, part of my job is to detect these things and to know they're going on. But it doesn't mean I have to change them. And I, I find that people in this field, uh, if they think if they notice something, they've got to fuck with it. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes all you have to do is just change what the cues are. And the process will be absolutely useful in terms of there being less of a pain in the ass anyway. Um, but anyway, I'd like you to pay attention to at least some of the things at this level of process. And I wanted to throw it out to give you some ideas. And then I wanted to spend a little time finding out what kinds of, because I know some of you are probably here because you had questions from last time. Some of you don't know why you're here. Um, but you will. <laughs> some of you are here because you had no place else to go. But uh, I wanted to take some time to find out at the beginning of these days, because it also gives me a chance to plan some things out. And sometimes you guys say something, and it makes me remember something I haven't taught in a long time, or something I meant to teach and never got around to, or decided I didn't like the group, so I wouldn't teach them, all kinds of things. I'm a fickle teacher. So what kinds of things were on your mind when you came here? What do you want to know more about? or something about. I want to know more about time sorts. Time sorts. What, what do you mean by time sorts? In time, between time, through time. What more do you want to know about it? I want to know more about how, they, uh, how it organizes a person's life. It seems like it have a strategic format to it. Seems like it have a, like. Could be more strategic. Like, people organize themselves. By time. Well. It seems like you could use them more strategically. Yeah. Is this yeah. what you're asking? Yes. Yes, you can. I want to know more about that. <laughs> well, what more do you want to know about it? Well, this is one of those questions where I don't know exactly what to ask. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Help me! <laughs> well, see, see, the thing is, is that there's so much more you can know about it. I thought since you asked the question, that I'd ask a few questions to find out what more you wanted to actually know about it. See, uh, the, one of the ways it, that I find out things a lot is through crystal ball gazing. How many of you, when you took a practitioner course, did crystal ball gazing? So you, well, that's an ascent. Whoever taught you your practitioner course, go back and kick them one. The reason we, did pra we, did, we, we designed the crystal ball gazing technique was to teach people how to go through listing programs and read nonverbal cues. It wasn't that we wanted them to read the nonverbal cues so much as we wanted them to know how to do the listing programs. Now, a listing program is, it's given that you've done this for a while, you kind of get an idea of what the set of choices are. 
you know, clients come in, you know, you could go through a whole rigmarole to figure things out. But after you figure them out, then you can kind of go through what the list of the choices are. See, for example, if, if you, you just listen to him talk, right? Okay. Now, if, if off the top of your head, just the conversation I had with him, would, would, would you place him as a real in-time person? Were you thinking about that while he was talking about it? Let's start with that question. Okay. Let's set some rules here. Let's go back to our bold type, all right? Now, the way to learn is to realize that whatever you're talking about is going on. And this is the, this is the difference between people using the technology and people using the techniques. See, now what I could do is I could assign an exercise right now that would give you an experience in in time and one in three time and one in between time. But so the fuck what, right? That's not going to teach you how to pay attention to the fact that, okay, see, I pay attention to, to as I go through a whole bunch of different things, some of the people are real interested in time. Now, uh, that, that's a giveaway right there. People who are interested in the difference between the three. Think about it, right? <laughs> difference between, okay? Shh, underline the word, right? Now. Okay, do you hear like perhaps some comparison going on there? Right? Now, okay. Now, his question was one where he wanted me to elucidate. Okay. Now, when someone asks you to elucidate, do you, does it mean that perhaps they're looking for similarities or differences? Okay. Perhaps. Okay. Now, if you start to hear this stuff, it makes all of this stuff a lot easier. Because, when you, because the trick is, is to figure out what you're going to do, whether it's with a client or a business or whether you're doing teaching. To be a good teacher, you have to figure out what to teach people. Because if you, don't t if you teach them something and it's not what it is they want to know, they'll go, yeah, yeah, that's all interesting, but. Right? Now, if you're a good teacher, then you can learn that there's a structural difference. OK, now, you wanna, you wanna, why don't you come up here, Al, and play a little game with me. I can tell that some of these people in here need to learn a little bit about language. Language is a tricky thing. You want to just put that on? Yeah. We're going to have some speaking lessons. Oh, good. OK. You remember speaking. OK. Now, OK, when you, all right. Now, this, the question you have is, is, OK, it seems to me that, and this is, might be a bit of a guess on my part, might not, but. Uh, that, that your curiosity about the difference between the two, you said there might be a more strategic use. Yes. OK, that means that there's one of them you want to do better. Maybe. Maybe. OK, well, I don't know. What motivated you to ask the question? Well, I've been thinking a lot about it since the last workshop. Yeah? So have you been thinking you want to do one better, or did you want to do one worse? No, I want to know more about it to do with other people. To oh, be able to listen for to them, somebody. huh? <laughs> Maybe me, too. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> All right. So you want to be able to do what better with other people? I want to be able to, to listen and notice how they're using their time to organize their experience, mm -hmm. whether it's between time and time or through time, or how they sequence or work them together, and how I can use that to help them to get more change. More change. Right. Maybe less change, better change. Think about it. OK. Say it. Maybe more change and better change. <laughs> well, let me tell you a secret. All right. One of the secrets to being able to work with other people is to hear what they say. Okay. This is your bit. <laughs> Maybe <Okay>. to. <laughs> Sorry, don't feel embarrassed now. <laughs> It's all right. After being around me, you can be around anybody. It's usually pretty easy. Good. <laughs> Your client, clients will walk in, you look at them, and you'll go, your ass is mine now. After what Richard did to me, I'm going to get you. <laughs> Somebody has to pay for this. It's <laughs> the way I think about it, you know. So I had a bad trip on an airline. You guys pay for it. I go, I'm going to teach you this technique. It'll make you really happy. <laughs> now, OK, maybe what you could consider is I want you to just try saying this, OK, okay. that what you could do if you learned about the difference between in time, through time, and between time, is to, is to do a little bit of change that had a higher quality outcome. Instead of more change, less change, but better change. Can you say that? All of that? 
Just the last line. Um, less change and better change. Right. Now, does the concept of making less change make more sense? Yes. You can make, kind of, sometimes. Huh? You make what? profound change, a little bit of change, if you do it in the right place. Well, the question is, do you want a lot of change or do you want a little change? The people. I mean, when you work with somebody, do you want a lot of change or a little change? Well, it's the right amount of change. The right amount. Well, how do you know it's the right amount? Well, so it gets them their outcome. Well, I mean, when you think about working with somebody, do you think about how much you can do with them or how little? Like about how much. Okay. How come? So they can get the most out of. <laughs> Have you ever heard so many quantifiers out of one person? <laughs> He loves quantifiers, too. All you have to do is say one in your language, and he lights up. <laughs> OK. Uh, how do you know? OK, now, I want you to think about it. between, through, and in. And think about it in terms of quantification. OK, where is quantification going to come up? OK, well, why is it going to come but through? OK, because if we're going to deal with people and, and how time affects them, you have to be able to hear it. Right? And like one of the things that he asked about is, is how do you notice it? Well, okay, if you start to hear questions like things about more and less, okay, things that have to do with sorting for difference, right? Okay, then between makes sense, right? Okay, if somebody is in time, are they going to be doing a lot of comparison? Huh? What's that? You're going to hear that a lot. <laughs> that would come up a little bit more. Huh? Well, their favorite word. Huh and what? That's uh, what I discovered now. It's my new theory of relationships, is that if you really move in with somebody, the one thing you can count on is that, is that you're, going, you're going to build your relationship on a, on a single word from that point on. That the major word that will go on in your relationship is not going to be love. It's going to be what? <laughs> what? It's, I've discovered the more, the more you get to know somebody intimately, the more they try to talk to you from different rooms. Um, it's the secret of relationships. If you love me, you should be able to hear me through walls. This is the presupposition. Now, and by the way, uh, that one of the things that will help you is, as you describe these from now on, what I'd like you to, to talk about it is between time considerations. When I work with somebody, I, I, I think of it this way. I think that what I'm dealing with is their in time considerations, their through time considerations, and their between time considerations. And which ones are more conscious than others? In his case, that makes sense, right? I think so. Good. Now, it also, just like rep systems, tells you things about how to talk to somebody so that it makes sense. You have to understand, just, just like, you know, if you take somebody who's super visual and you talk to them about feelings, you know, I mean, if you take the most arch visual in the world, Carl Rogers is the easiest person to talk to. I mean, he's the one that, you know, you'd go, well, you know, the world looks dim and dark in the future. And you go, you know, you feel that you can't get a handle on the future. And they go, yeah. I guess so. Now, there's a difference between translating for somebody. But by the same token, when you have somebody who's operating in this kind of quantification. Now, what, who in here considers themselves an in-time person? They're in time a lot. Ben. Yes. Yes what, Ben? Yes, I consider myself <laughs> an in-time in person. Oh, OK. So review is an intimate part of your life. Review is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not when I'm in time. <laughs> Not when you're in time for what? <laughs> now. Huh? For now. <laughs> right, now is forever. Yeah. I now. Use forever. Now is forever. <laughs> <laughs> Were you into Bob Arandas? <laughs> Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> Be honest, that's my first diagnostic category for in time people. Did they right. buy the book Be Here Now? Right. You know, did they decide being here now? Because see, I'm gonna write a book, Be Here Then. <laughs> <laughs> Be here Where? there. Where? <laughs> that uh, see, one of the
one of the things you discover about, about the thing about in time is that if you try to provide, if when in time people can make comparisons, as you lay out one thing to another, they notice how they feel different in time about it. But when you ask them to make the comparison themselves, jumping back and forth is a little difficult. What we need is for you guys to start to pay attention between the difference. Now, what's a through time consideration? Does anybody know what through time is? What's the difference between in time and through time? Anyway, who are you, you guys were here last time. You remember the last workshop? Now. <laughs> Charles, what's a through time person? Through time person goes through their, they review their memories, they review their lives. As opposed to, what's, as an in time person is, doesn't have memories? Then they step fully into the memory and they're in each memory through their own eyes. As opposed to through whose eyes? <laughs> <laughs> a Oops! <laughs> That's a nice color red. <laughs> yeah, through whose eyes, Charles? Like through anybody's eyes, but they'll be inside. Anybody them. but! Yeah. Right. Well, this is, this is where, what kind of language are you going to hear with through time? Major considerations are going to be referential index. Switches. I mean, now, how could you tell that? Because you're going to hear things like, well, a through time person, they would. In other words, when you're doing through time, what does one do? Now, if, if you begin to listen to hear distinctions, because you have to understand, these are not bad things, right? What makes them funny is that we all do them, and they work. The fact that they work is a double-edged sword. They can work for us, or they can work against us. And again, you know, it's not a thing of, of switching from one to the other uh, or changing. It's, it's knowing that you can in a context where it's useful. So that if you, you, know, you discover yourself doing something which is uh, pointless, and that's part of being a human being. You've got to remember, human beings are learning machines. They learn everything. And a lot of it is real garbage. And it doesn't mean that, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you have to stay that way. I mean, it's like, uh, there, I mean, there are some clients I've had that it didn't matter which woman they were with, they were with another woman in their head. Like, and so they never, in, order, in order to pay attention to, to the woman they were married to, they had to go out with other girls. <laughs> Makes sense, right? But I mean, if, if to them, it was, to them, they were so much between time, and it's not really useful if you can only visit somebody when they're not there. It's not a terribly practical way to live your life. And when it hits the point where somebody can again start to laugh at it, this is where they can begin to do something about it. And I find that, in a, I find that a lot of people take NLP much too seriously. And it, it, there, is, there is a trick about NLP, that as you begin to get into, especially the levels we're dealing with, if you don't have your sense of humor about you, you will fall into what's called the spin. And it is a trap that's there. People who are too serious cannot do things at this level. Because what happens is they start thinking about their thinking, about their thinking, and it becomes self-referential, and they go zzzz, and it all blanks out. Trust me, I've seen it for years. That's when they start making, and then you can always tell because they make up a diagnostic test at a metaprogram. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fail-safe mechanism when you've truly made a total bozo of yourself is that then you, what you do is you start using metaprograms to diagnose people because as soon as you know what somebody's metaprogram is, it's just a function of utilization. But if you diagnose people category by category, it doesn't do it context by context. And if you diagnose people, especially with a paper and pencil test, you will find out what their metaprogram is in relationship to, meta, to paper and pencil tests. But it doesn't necessarily tell you what's going to happen because if you have somebody who sorts by the person, they're going to be thinking about, they'll have to hallucinate who made up the test. As opposed to somebody that sorts by the place, then it will depend upon where they're taking the test. So that the test itself is going to have referential index things. So that the actual jig, or as Heisenberg called it, the uncertainty principle that has to do with the test is going to have to do with the distinctions. And, I mean, because, see, like, I think you could, you know, when you, with some people, you can elicit things from them in one context as opposed to another, and they change. This is one of the important things about being able to take somebody who is, whether they're between time, in time, or through time, and jamming them in time when you take them back into the past. That your ability to be able to operate 
and to get people, because you have to understand the fact that people do things doesn't mean they can't do the others. And sometimes it takes a good swift kick in the ego. Sometimes you can get them to laugh. Sometimes it takes a handshake interrupt. But a lot of times, basically what it takes is a good clubbing over the head of one form or another to get people jarred out of their normal state and into enough of an altered state when you work with them. But this is done after you gather information. See, to me, I spend time gathering information and then I bludgeon them into an altered state in which I can make changes. Because, see, like one of the things Steve and I were talking about yesterday is I told him that when I was studying hypnosis, I discovered a strange phenomenon. If you could get people into the state where you could do speak privately and age regression, they could do any hypnotic phenomenon whatsoever from that particular transition. Now, sometimes it was tough to get people into those states. Because if you take a between-time person and try to get them into the state of speak privately, they want to be there and not be there at the same time because they're constantly flipping back and forth. That's why you must bludgeon them into one state or another. For example, there, there are tricks to getting people. Like, for example, if before you do trance work, if you switch their timeline so that it's an in-time, you know, so if you take somebody, for example, do you know your timeline? How does mm -hmm. it run? This way. This way. <laughs> like the past is over here, the future is over there? Yeah. Or does it just kind of spread out <laughs> flat in front of <laughs> I had somebody who was like a fan. And uh, it was funny because the, the experiences when they were young were very long feathers on the fan. And the closer it got to this age, the shorter the feathers got. And I just wondered what happened when they ran out of room. Just a thought that occurred to me that if you took a pair of scissors and chopped them all off, what would happen? <laughs> but they were fun to play with because you could grow the feathers out longer when they were older and they felt younger. <laughs> Didn't she? <laughs> Now, <laughs> now, back to what a listing program is. Okay, the things that I've been running through through this conversation are called listing programs, and as I went through them, you could watch them fire off in different people. That's why I brought you up here so you could watch. So you have to understand, I'm still answering your question. Right. Okay, but I couldn't answer your question with you in the back of the room, because the way in which I go through and I find out things about the both the ramifications of timelines, what they work for and what they don't work for, and with individuals, what's operational, is by running a listing program. So that even as I describe a timeline, mm -hmm. describe a phenomenon, you can watch who it affects. Mm -hmm. Now, as I run through with a lot of people, when I want to find out how to make a timeline work better, again, still answering your question, the thing is, is as I run through a listing program about where, the, because I'm very familiar, having asked a lot of people, about where the limitations occur. So that if I run through, if I'm going to do something to alter a timeline, it's going to be contextual for what particular context to either go into trance, to enrich their sex life, <coughs> to make it so that they're, you know, they can pay attention in their work more, uh, so that they can uh, have more fun. Because a lot of people, when they're having fun, uh, don't notice it because they're not fully there. They're somewhere else comparing it with other times they've had fun. <laughs> 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 and... <laughs> And if they were to, for example, this is just something off the top of my head. God, I love this shit. I wouldn't have any other job in the world, you know? I thought about getting a job at Photomat and doing this stuff while people came in to bring their film in. Just because they'd be less suspecting. But then I decided I could just go into Photomat and do it to them. I feel sorry for certain people when they don't know. I, had, I, had a, I went into a Dairy Queen yesterday and was talking to somebody, and they'll never be the same. Every time they look at hamburgers now, they'll have a whole world in there. So I began to, I said, you know, if you really focus your eyes on the top of one of these hamburgers, I said, you can begin to see a whole city in there of people walking around. <laughs> That's right, and if you then just let your eyes close, a whole world appears, and then I just left. <laughs> And then now they're going to have to, if they're a between-time person, figure out if that really happened or not. That's like, it's like asking yourself, have you ever gone to some place and thought you were having a great time and then afterwards wondered whether you really had a good time or not? Was I really having fun? Was it real fun? Or did I just think I was having fun? You know what I mean? See, no, I don't do that one. What? When I have fun, I know it. When you have fun, you know it. Somebody's internal process screaming. <laughs> 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 
gee, is there somebody that wants to know how to have fun and when they're having it? Well, of course, if you, if, you, if you live between times, you know when you're having fun because you know when you're not, which is a useful distinction to have. See, it, the people that, that, that have a tendency to not notice that would be people doing through time activities because they'd be doing it and think they're supposed to be having fun and then they, you know, when they go back and review it, then maybe they weren't. Depressives are a lot like that. Depressives are real good at that kind of thing. See, you, you have to be able to notice which things fit, which ones don't, and when you find out, you know, because you don't want to fix anything that's not broken. And, and also, when something works, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's only the things that are going to enrich somebody's life. See, there's, there's, there's too much people, there's too much of this stuff that goes on. I even tried to diligently, through the course of my practitioner course, to cure the people who had previous training of the tendency to try to, you know, to jump clients, right? You know, somebody goes in and they go, well, you know, I've got this going on. And they go, aha, we'll change it. Uh, the thing is, is leave it alone till you know what to do. I mean, just leave it alone. When you ask the question, were you asking something for him or were you asking about yourself? Do you know? Them how questions are tricky. How do you, how do you know that you're having fun? That's something I always want to know more about. That's one of the reasons I ask is because if they have a better way to have fun than I do, I want to, I want both. I mean, I still, I, I, I get clients to teach me stuff all the time. I make no bones about it. You know, they'll tell me something, and I'll go, ooh, I want to know how to do that. You know, but I say that inside my head, and then I ask, act very concerned like I'm trying to treat them and stuff. You know, it's their money. I, they it's just a byproduct of our profession is, is getting to be able to steal behaviors and stuff. It's, it's not something that's a bad thing. I think a lot of times people get into this thing that, you know, if you ask the question, was it about you? Well, you know, if it is about you, and, you know, the question was about having fun, there's nothing wrong with that. You got to get out of this thing that if you know, see this stuff. There was like a sickness in psychology. It was a bad thing to project on your client. I think in NLP it's a good thing. Remember, we're dealing with subjectivity. You can hallucinate on your clients. You get to do whatever you want. See, this is one of the fringe benefits. The only difference is, is to be able. It's just as long as you're doing it, is to know that you are, and then enjoy it. You know, if you're going to hallucinate on your clients, it's fine. If you're going to ask questions, but they're really about what you want to know and not them, that's fine. Because as long as you know that it's about you, then you get to hear the answer. See, otherwise you might miss it. And to me, you know, that, that you have to get out of the distinctions of right, wrong, and good, and bad, and get into, it's just information. You have to get into this state, and in order to get into this state, you have to do something. Like, let me ask you, I usually like to start groups with, with a little something, because I, I think some modalities have a real advantage. Let me ask you to do something just to give you a break from data overload. We'll come back to data overload because I love that state. I love the looks in your eyes. I can tell when it gets painful, and that's when I really like to do it more. So. <laughs> but I decided just we'll ease into that, you know, because I want you to be bleeding information out of your pores by the time we leave here. But I want you to go out and go like this and just throw information on the ground and step on it. But then every time you talk to people, you're going to start sucking it out of them. You can always tell when you do it really good because they feel tired at the end of the session, and you feel exhilarated. <laughs> <laughs> That's my idea of a good session. I love it when the clients look at you and they go, I'm fixed enough. Leave me alone. And I go, well, there's just one more thing. <laughs> See, to me, when you, when, you, when you really put together packages for people, one of the things that happens is instead of just doing a technique with them, you go through not just a bombardment of techniques, but learning how to sequence a set of techniques with people together so that you literally build in four or five different changes that work together. And I think that one of the things that, that has been overlooked is being able to, to build together a series of things and knowing how to nest them together so that, so that they function as a unit and watch them interact. That, that to me, that whenever I do things, I always install a chain. See, it's not that I do one or the other. I install a chain at the same time because to me, there's got to be a sequence of kinesthetic responses that go underneath whatever I've done. And the, because there's a rule of thumb that I use. It's to create a void in somebody's life and then fill it with something, not just create a void. Um, there's too much of that going on. But what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to do something just to sharpen up, just to make sure your submodality elicitation is in line, and also to get you into the right state. Because the other thing is, 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 I, is I, I emphasize over and over and over again that the state that you're in when you do NLP is essential. 
In order to gather information, you have to be somewhat in a somewhat ferocious state when you work with clients. I figure when you work with clients, man, you, got, you have to have an attitude on. It doesn't have to show, but you've got to have it. That when you look at them, you know, you've got to look at them. And their problems have to seem inconsequential because you start out of the gate knowing they're not broken and knowing they feel broken. They feel that something is wrong. They feel that they're inadequate or they, they either come in trying to prove that everything is okay, even the ones that are forced to go. I mean, a lot of them come in, they're trying to prove that everything's all right, and if everything was all right, no one would be able to force them to do that. You know, I mean, you know, right down from the teenager that's flunking out of school, you know, and they go, well, school's so boring anyway, you know, you done it, and I always go, look, you know, if you're really as sharp as you say, you should at least be able to con your teachers into giving you good grades. You want to learn to manipulate your teachers, or you want to learn to sit here and take shit from me? And I can lay it on, too, and, and I demonstrate usually, <laughs> thus motivating them. Uh, that to me, that, that part of the attitude is, is, is that to get people on the highway, I mean, to me, that one of the things I think about it is, is that, that, that the time that people spend indulging in, in thinking that they're broken and whining and pissing and moaning and all the stuff that they do that surrounds difficulties and problems, whether it's grief or whether it's based on real stuff or not, I mean, whether it's based on real trauma, imagined trauma, or no trauma, it's all the same to me. They're not going forward, they're going backwards. And you really only get to go one way in life. Mentally, you can go backwards, but time marches on. And that if, for people to be able to move out on the highway and just, you know, put the fun meter to the red line and start enjoying life requires that, that you know, that the Michigas gets out of the way, but it mostly, it mostly takes a change in focus of their, in, their attention. See, instead of what can they avoid, this guy was, there was nothing in this guy's life thinking about what he could get that was avoiding missing out on goodies. He's going to avoid things. Let's give him something worth avoiding. Avoid, you know, all he could miss out on. Passion, lust, you know. And, you know, part of one of the things that it takes is the ability to describe what somebody will miss out on so much that they don't want to miss it. That part of the art form of, of NLP and the real skill is the, is the application of the Milton model patterns to the point where you can describe, because this guy had, this guy had never been on a date. See, I mean, this guy's older than I am. He's never been out with a woman. I mean, you know, it's inconceivable to me. I mean, you know, because I mean, when I asked him, I said, when's the last time you were out with a woman? And he said, well, you know, I've had this problem. I've never been out with a woman. And I said, you've never been out with a woman, ever? And he, well, and he said, well, my mother. And I said, it's not the same. And he said, well, I know about it. I've seen movies. And I said, but you were alone when you saw them. Those are the kind of movies somebody should be with you when you're watching. But to be able to describe it in a way where it scares the hell out of him that he would miss, miss out on it, to be able to describe him 20 years down the road so that he's 70 years old and he looks at his life and he's never had the experience of, and then to go into a 15-minute, absolutely vivid description to the point where it terrifies the shit out of him that he'd miss out on it, that when he looks at this fear and that fear, suddenly the balance changes. One of the things that it requires is that, is that when I looked at this guy, it was, to me, it was as amazing and as mystical experience as it could possibly be that somebody would chance living their life this way. See, to me, the biggest gamble would be, would he live this way? And the gamble was, at this point, my hands. I mean, it's not that it, the next day it wouldn't be in my hands. It's the ball's got to be thrown in his court. But to me, as I listen to it, you know the kinds of experiences you've had where, where the air is full of static electricity? I mean, it's almost as if time is standing still, that something so amazing happens that you're just absolutely enraptured, that every sense that you have is wide open, and not because of, of danger, but because, you know, it's like the first time, I, you know, I grew up pretty much in the city, and the first time that I got out of the city, I went with a group of people, and we went out in the middle of the desert. And I didn't, you know, deserts were pictures and books and cowboy shows on TV. And we got there in the middle of the night, and I woke up early in the morning, and the sun came up, I looked around and it was the, you know, there was like things like real air, you know, which was a new one on me. 
And I mean, just as the sun came up and it came across, and I mean, the feeling in the air was alive with just, I mean, it was like you could put your hand out and it would just make sparks off of every finger. Everything, in every sense, and it, it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Now, I know you've had experiences like that where you are completely and utterly exhilarated. I want to just start this morning because I want you to try something a little bit different. I want you to go and I want you to uh, take your partner and I want you to elicit the submodalities of that versus the way they do NLP now. Okay, now once you have the submodalities of complete focused exhilaration, what I want you to do is I want you to have them go onto their timeline, step into the future five minutes, just five, 10, 15 minutes ahead, just a nudge ahead. And what I want you to do is have them step in, and I want you to try those submodalities three ways. I want you to have them go up to the future 15 minutes through time, have them do it in time. That means you adjust their timeline. By the way, the easiest way to adjust your timeline is to put it where it is and move yourself, okay? So if somebody's timeline runs like this, for example, why don't you stand up, let me show them here. For example, if you, you stop and think, think about the last time you were utterly and overwhelmingly fit what I just described, exhilarated? Mm -hmm. Okay, now go back, close your eyes, hold the submodalities constant, okay? Now, you see where this experience is on your timeline? Okay, now what I want you to do is to hold your timeline still, okay? And I want you to orient your body so that you literally walk around so that you're looking through the experience into the future. Literally physically move. But you want to end up looking through the experience into the future. It's right there in front of me. Okay, so, but the future is over there, isn't it? It was, but it's there now. It's there now. Yeah. Okay, well that's how you end up. Okay, well close your eyes, go back, look through it, right into the future. Now what I want you to do is to hold the submodalities constant. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I want you to think about the exercise you're just about to do with somebody. Mm -hmm. You're going to get to find out how their brain works, all that mm -hmm. stuff. What I want you to do is hold the submodalities constant, and I want you to step through it and literally build the context where you're doing this with somebody that has all those same feelings. Step right through it, hold the context, and then that's the way it's supposed to feel when you do NLP now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Good. All right, then go for it. Grab yourself a partner. And remember, when you do future pacing, all of this stuff counts. Okay? Did you hear that? This is yes, this is no. If it's no, shake your head like this. It's okay. Her head got stuck. It was like, no, it, it doesn't, but my head won't move if you don't give me a no. Okay, remember he was between time? Okay, so when I said it's going to feel this way now and in the future, this is the way it should feel. This is the basis of comparison. With a between time person, that's how you install things in the future. By telling them it feels this way now, when you do this in the future, it should feel this way or better. And then that way, if it's not feeling that way, they'll know they're not doing it right. They will change their behavior, won't they? Okay, is it clear now? See, shaking your head no isn't so bad, is it? Can you feel this would be useful? Do you see my point? Good. All right, grab yourself a partner and do this. Only I want you to try it all three ways, through time, in time, and between time. Once you have the submodalities and you orient them, step them through it, then literally have them move through it continuously Move through it by jumping back and forth, and then move through it and observe from somebody else's point of view that they're doing it the right way. Okay? Grab yourself a partner and go for it. You guys find that interesting? Now, do you like exhilaration as a state? Does it tune, does it liven up your senses? Right? Now, do you, because I might, one of the things I've noticed about uh, uh, many of my colleagues is that, uh, that they go to workshops and like, especially they come to my workshops and I try to teach them that, you know, you, you want to be alert, you want to be in a, a fun state, you, you want to have your senses wide open and you want to be real ferocious when you do NLP. 
And then the next exercise after that, I see him real serious, you know. And uh, it's like, to me, the, the next step is to be able to take this and to build it as a through time phenomenon and an associated through time phenomenon. Because through time, of course, can be disassociated. You can look at time going by like that, or you can be more like, you know, the exercises we did last time where you were inside like the decision destroyer, where you do it like a tunnel? Well, see, if, if, if you think about things that are pervasive, like th for me, things like attitude. Attitude is something that, that doesn't have a tendency to oscillate from moment to moment. It's something that goes on through things. It, uh, that some, you know, that there are some people that are pessimistic about everything, and there are some people that are blindly optimistic about everything. And their optimism is pervasive, that they, they have a tendency to look at the good in everyone and to look at the good stuff. That one of the things about attitude to build in in yourself is, is to build in that kind of a state as something that if you can't get it there all the time, to at least get it there when you're trying to use the technology called NLP. Because the one thing is, is as you begin to become serious about artificial distinctions, it begins to get you to act like a horse's ass. I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, uh, I've, I've especially found that, that when using NLP techniques, because uh, one of the, the interesting things that happened recently, I went to Montreal, which is, uh, I haven't been there in 15 years. And I, I got there the day ahead of time, and I was sitting in the hotel, and there were some people in the workshop sitting there uh, discussing NLP seriously. And uh, uh, the, their conversation, I mean, for me, really fringed on high comedy. I sat there laughing, but, uh, you know, they hadn't, they hadn't watched enough of Steve's videotapes. It's blowing my cover, by the way, all these damn videotapes. I can't sneak around anymore. People know what I look like now. And, that's uh, so why I never put my picture on the books, was so that I got the luxury of going in a day ahead of time and listening to the people that arrived at the hotel and they'd stay there uh, discuss what they knew NLP was. I mean, I got to talk to people on planes and all kinds of stuff. But one of the things that got me is, is that they were discussing, uh, there was one guy there in particular who had been doing NLP longer than other people, which somehow or other he thought made him better at it. And I know some people have been doing NLP for years that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, don't know shit, but since they've been doing it for a long time, even though they haven't learned anything new in a lot of years, uh, they know the right way to do NLP. And this guy was talking about the right way to learn NLP. And uh, his description of the right way to learn NLP sounded like the right way to learn to be a coal miner. Um, you know, it was like, I mean, he, his description of it is, is that it had to be painful to learn. And that you had to go through and you had to use every technique on yourself before you could use it on anyone else. And I was thinking of all the techniques that if you use on yourself will just hurt you. Because I figured in the morning I was going to give him a list. <laughs> and there was a couple people there that just hadn't been through anything other than an intro. And they were listening to this drivel. And, you know, uh, one of them made a comment to this guy. They said, well, you know, I just came to the workshop because I heard it would be a lot of fun. And this guy looked very condescendingly. Well, I don't know who told you that. And I thought, boy, you wait till tomorrow, asshole. <laughs> You're going to pay your dues. That, that part of it being fun is that, that, that see, when, when you're in a state where you can really laugh at things, it's an altered state. I mean, when you really begin to see the humor, if you've ever seen a really good comic, they, they don't really describe things that don't happen. They have a tendency to describe reality. But their description of it makes it so that it is funny. And, when you, and the nice thing about it is, is if you get back in similar context to the one they describe, sometimes it seems funny, whereas before it was painful. Now, the induction of that kind of an altered state, which is a part of what NLP is about, most of the techniques, which are NLP techniques, are powerful trance inductions. That if you do the phobia cure without inducing a profound altered state, you will get very limited results that a big part of it has to do with that, that the application of a technique works insofar as you use language. I mean, it's not just the activity of what somebody does in their mind. It's the way in which you use your intonation pattern. And, you know, because you can't do the phobia cure without pacing with your voice tone, your voice tempo. 
and to make sure that you pace and lead people into as profound an altered state as you can. Because for them, you have to understand, fear is an altered state. And when somebody goes into an elevator and they're terrified out of their mind, I mean, that elevator, in, in essence, has become a re-induction signal to go into the state of fear. Thank you.